And with that, we're going to start. So you can open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10 as we continue through the New Testament. And, the, you know, it's interesting. The Bible in Thessalonians says, he talks about God's word working effectual in you. When you hear God's word, it does something in you. It changes you. It's the only thing that changes the human heart. Hebrews was written. There were Jews who became Christians, and they were being pressured by, I mean, imagine growing up your whole life. Think of Judaism, how that would have looked to them. And you've got all these Jewish friends saying, you know, Jesus is fine, but you need to come back here and do these sacrifices, and you've got to keep the law. And, you're being, and they were being pressured to go backwards. And so Hebrews, he's comparing everything they have with the Old Testament with Jesus, and, and, I, and I'll tell you something, you, pair, you compare anyone with Jesus, they're going to fall short. Jesus is better than the prophets, better than Moses, better than the law, everything there. And then the old covenant and new covenant. This, this contract we have, this new testament is way better than the old one. And I got an analogy, a couple analogies. Um, you know, the old testament and any religion, picture a balance. You know what balances are where you can weigh things, you know, and they used to do that for commerce. Well, imagine, and the, the picture is, okay, here's my sin, kind of on one side, and I got to, like, do good works to, to tilt it in my favor, okay? I got to, and maybe God will accept me. That's the idea behind it. Well, imagine all your good works is like a handful of feathers, okay? Put it on one side. I don't care how many works you do. It's like a handful of feathers. The other side, your sin is like a, a, like a, a lead brick, you put that on that balance, boom. But that isn't all your sin. That's just one sin. Every sin is a lead brick. There's no chance your works, the feathers, is ever going to tilt the scale. It's not possible. Okay, the gospel, what Jesus does, he literally comes along and he knocks that lead weight of sin off the scale completely. It's gone. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? And the thing, and, and here's another analogy, and this one you'll really be able to relate to. Anybody ever get have credit card debt? Anybody ever spend their credit cards more than they should? And you do it around the holidays. Imagine you go out and you're spending, and you spend, and you spend, and you're buying stuff you shouldn't. And inside, don't you have kind of an internal calculator? Aren't you kind of like, oh, man, I've been using this too much, right? And what is, what is, what is it that you dread? You dread the bill coming in the mail, right? Okay, imagine you're running it up. The bill comes, you know, that envelope sitting on your desk. What do you not want to do? <laughs> How many of you have put off, put off opening because you don't want to see it? And you open it up and it's like, oh, God, did I spend that? You, before you open it, you're like, Lord, please let it be under this amount. Please, please, please. <laughs> and you know it's not going to be. And you open it like, ah, oh, I can't believe I spent that much. And so then you pay the minimum. So you got a $4,000 credit card, but you pay the minimum. You know, if you pay the minimum on that, what does it say? It's like 18 years to pay it off and a $4,000 bill, you end up paying about $12,000 before it's done. That's how they make all their money. Well, imagine every month you do this, you run this thing up and you keep spending it and you keep paying the minimum and you keep doing that um, month after month after month. Wouldn't that be kind of like a weight on you? How many of you say, anybody ever been weighted down by debt? It's like, ah, and you know you got to pay it back. You know you can't. Okay, that's religion right there, okay? That, you're paying the minimum, and that thing's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, imagine some billionaire finding out your dilemma, and he comes along, and not only does he pay it, he puts his name behind your account that any charge on that credit card gets paid off. Now, imagine the joy. Imagine this. You get that bill in the mail, and you open it up. What does it say? Zero. Would you like be, if it, if it was a real credit card bill, would you be like, just like, this is great. Where did this come from? And you find out somebody, wouldn't you be, wouldn't you be thankful to that person? Okay, the gospel is, the balance is zero. Jesus paid for it. All you got to do is come through him, trust him. Is that like an awesome thing? Who would say that's a far better deal than the other one? That is exactly, and the thing is, and with that in mind, and imagine this, imagine it was a person, you know, not a credit card bill, but, but a person. You'd kind of want to avoid them, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you feel uncomfortable around them if you owed them a big bunch of money, okay? Well, imagine the bill's paid. It's zero. You don't owe them anything. Now you can be around them. There's a comfort there. You have access in a sense. And Jesus has made a way 
the debt's paid so I can freely go to God. And so the idea is I can go to him. And so then there's a responsibility, whether it's for salvation, whether it's for any need in your life, the door's open to God. How many of you want to be close to God? Then, then draw near to him. He says he'll draw near to you. And matter of fact, there's a responsibility. Because if you don't, if you neglect that, if that way is made and you never take advantage of that, then you're going to face the consequences. There's a judgment that comes with that. It's a, it's a serious thing. Jesus made the way. But if you don't go his way, there's no other way to God. You guys realize that? There's no other way. And so that's what this chapter is about. So Lord, open our eyes to the reality of this new covenant how wonderful it is. The balance is zero. The weight's taken away. The debt is paid. And we can go to you, God, through what you did, Jesus. Help us not neglect that. Help us to seek you, to walk with you, to come to you, to draw near to you. And oh, Lord, just make these things real to us. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So Hebrews 10. But let's look at the couple verses right before in chapter 9, verse 27. As it is appointed to men once to die, then the judgment, you will die and you will stand before God and give account for your life. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and to them that look for him, you'll appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So if you're saved, if you take advantage of this, you can look forward to him returning, anticipating, not dreading. And on chapter 10, verse one, for the law having a shadow of good things to come. You know, he told us that, that um, Moses, God told him, Look at, he showed him his throne. He says, make, make, make it after this pattern. And so when you're saved, you, be, you come into God's house in a sense. We are his house. He dwells among us. And, um, but the law was just a shadow. And, and, I, and I meet people every year that comes along, they come along and they discover the Old Testament and they get all excited about it. And they basically start telling Christians, hey, we got to be under the law. We got to keep Ten Commandments. We gotta, and, there, and there's a pressure. And, and they come across like they're a little more holy, a little more righteous. And, um, but the thing is, it's a shadow of the reality. Hey, do you want to live in your house or do you just want to live in the shadow of your house? Try that tonight when it's, you know, 10 degrees. What's better, being in the house or just the shadow? What is the shadow worth? Nothing. It's worth nothing. The reality. The, the, the Old Testament is just a shadow. It pointed us to the reality. We're not under the law. And there's people that might say, what do you mean? You just go out and lie and steal? And No way. You know, we're married to Jesus. We're going to follow the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will go beyond the law. The law says don't commit adultery. The Holy Spirit says love your wife as Jesus loved the church. The law says don't steal. The Spirit says Work with your hands to give to those that are in need. And so the reality surpasses the shadow. It's better in every, any way. And he says, for the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there into perfect or complete. And they always still had sin. It covered it. It was looking ahead in faith, but it didn't take it away. For then they would not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers once purged would have no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices, there's a remembrance again made of the sins every year. See, our conscience can be clear. You might still sin, but the blood of Jesus cleanses your conscience, the weight of it, the weight of that debt. Listen, imagine every day you get that credit card bill, even though you're putting things on it, and every day it says what? It says zero. It says zero if you're in Christ. And he says, um, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Um, it never took away their sins. It takes away our sins as far as the east is from the west. And then verse 5, wherefore, when he comes into the world, meaning God, God the Son, Jesus is God. And um, he said, sacrifice and offering you would not, but a body you've prepared me. It wasn't that Jesus came to offer animals. He was going to offer himself. And so here you have this idea that God comes into the world, you know, and became one of us. And he said, in burnt offerings and sacrifice, you had no pleasure. Pleasure, God wasn't pleased, meaning his justice wasn't satisfied. Listen, guys, God has attributes. He's all-knowing, all-powerful. God is love. Is God love? He's also just and holy. His justice won't allow his love to forgive us. There was a song that has a very subtle flaw in it. It says, because of your love, we're forgiven. Not true. Does God love everybody? Yep. Is everybody forgiven? Nope. Here's why. See, God's just and holy. Sin has to be dealt with. 
His love sent him to the cross, but because of the cross, we're forgiven. Because of the cross, God's justice was satisfied. Now he can forgive us, okay? Love led him there, but love's not why he forgives. And so the cross is what satisfied, what pleased God's justice. And then verse seven, then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, it says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. God the Word, literally, it's like the Old Testament, all that God is came and took a body. What's interesting is the Bible says that, and Jesus said this, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So a window into your heart is what's coming out of your mouth. Anybody here ever have stuff that's not good come out of your mouth? Who's ever had nastiness and harshness and foulness? Okay. And, you know, it's funny. I have people come around me, and, and I'm a pastor, and they'll cuss. Oh, well, sorry. I'm like, I'm not the one you got to worry about, okay? God sees that. When something comes out of your mouth, there's a window into your heart. If you have foulness coming out of your mouth, it's a heart problem. You need to ask God, Lord, change my heart. Well, if my words are a window into my heart, then God's word is a window into what? His heart. So in the Old Testament, God reveals his heart to us. We see the things he hates, the things he likes, you know, and um, but Jesus is God's word. And so Jesus literally the Old Testament took on a body. And so if he's God's word, what do you see in Jesus? You see God's heart. Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. So yeah, the, the woman taken to the adultery, the law says she's got to be stoned. What do you say? Well, whoever's without sin cast the first stone. So first of all, you know, who can, who can put her to death? Only someone without sin. He stands up and says, woman, where are your accusers? There's one person there without sin. Jesus could have threw a stone, right? They're not here. Well, neither do I condemn thee. Why? Because the heart of God, as much as he hates sin, he loves us, and he intended to go to the cross and pay for our sins. So the heart of God is to take away sin so that what? We can come to him. And that's what's revealed. Do you want to know what God's like? Look at Jesus. Jesus said, you see me, you've seen the Father. What's interesting, he said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Jesus came to reveal the Father. Our job is to reveal Jesus. Everything the Father said Jesus said everything he did, he did. Jesus' job was to be connected with the Father and just yield to him. Our job is to be connected with Jesus and just yield to him. How many of you have said things that you knew it was God speaking through you? You ever had that happen? I've had it happen. That's awesome. How many of you have said things that definitely wasn't God? That's the stuff you got to stop. And there's things I've done where I've sensed the presence of God moving through me to touch someone else's life. That's great. But it's the other things. And so, but here he's literally... It's like the volume of the book, God's heart comes out in the living color and walks among us. And he says, verse eight, above when he said, sacrifice and offering of burnt offerings and offering for sin, you would not, neither had pleasure therein, um, which are offered by the law. And so again, his justice wasn't satisfied. Verse nine, then said he, Lord, come to do thy will, O God. He takes the way of the first and he may establish the second. Again, there's people, I know Christians right now that are telling me we got to keep the law, we're under the law. No, he takes away the first. The first is to bring us to Christ. The law was to show you you're guilty, you're a sinner. How many of you recognize you're a guilty sinner? Okay, so that's what the law did its job. It pointed you to Christ. Now you're under him. And he said that it may establish the second. Establish means um, to make firm, to keep in place the second covenant, the covenant where the balance says zero, okay? And then verse 10, by the which will, or God's purpose, we are sanctified, that means set apart through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So what Jesus did, it wasn't by our goodness, it was by God's goodness. What Jesus did on the cross once and for all were, were set apart and a way is made for us. And then um, in verse 11, and every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice which can never take away sin. The implication is Jesus did take away our sins. And he said, but this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever. How many of you have, how many of you recognize your sins were paid for on the cross, right? How many of you have sinned since you came to Jesus? See, it's, it's all of our sins. He took, he took care of them all the way completely. And he sat down the right hand of God. Here's a, here's a thing that, you know, we fall back under this old balancing thing, the credit card bill, what we owe. Where it comes into play a lot of times is, 
I mean, you sin. I don't know about you, but you sin and you're like, oh, Lord, I'm so guilty. I feel so bad. Like, you want to do something to make up for it. And that's, anybody here grew up Catholic? I grew up Catholic. They had the idea of penance. What does that mean? That means when I sin, I got to somehow do something to pay it back. They would, they would flog themselves, lay on, they would lay on bed of nails to somehow punish themselves to make up for sin. And, um, and it, 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 the way to picture it is there's like two rooms. You're either in the room based on religion, the balance, the scales, you know, the bill where you, you, you owe and you got to pay it back, that weight. You're either in that room or you're in the room where it's God's grace and it's because of what Jesus did on the cross and he says you're righteous because of Jesus. Look, do we still sin as Christians? We do. But see, my standing is based on what Jesus did. And what's interesting is I heard this said and it's really cool. We stand before God as Jesus because Jesus stood before God as us. You realize that? He stood before God as us in our sin and took the punishment. And now when I go before God, I'm standing as though Jesus was. Is that like an awesome thing, guys? And he's on the right hand of God, right hand of power, meaning the power of God is in Jesus. From henceforth expecting to his enemies be made his footstool. Hey, guys, there's a spiritual war going on. You know, there's a pressure for us to turn away. You know, there's many ways to God and and, um, and, and there's so much attacking Jesus in the Bible, but it's not true. And um, let me tell you something, guys. I've heard it said, I've read the end of the book, and we win. Actually, Jesus wins, and those who are with him. And, and, and he's, he is waiting. The Father is going to make his enemies his footstool. We have a choice whether you're his friend or his enemy. The way is made. But Philippians says, every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. You will bow and say he's Lord. Now, you can do it willingly right now and you'll go to heaven, or you'll be forced to, and it's the last thing you'll do before you're cast in the lake of fire. And um, I think this is the easier way is right now. Can you guys say that? I don't want to face Jesus as an enemy, and look what he did for me. It makes no sense to wait. But are there people in rebellion against him who refuse to bow, refuse to bow right now? Are there people like that? There are. Man, oh man, there, there's an antichrist spirit right now, guys. You know, you try to attack any group and you're going to be crucified, but it's okay to attack Christians. Do you realize that? And, um, and so we need to realize in the end, he's going to win and those with him. For by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. So the moment you accepted Jesus, you are complete forever. Let that sink in. You do fail at times. You do fall. But again, which room are you in? Are you in the room where you're basing it on your works? Are you in the room where it's based on Christ? If it's based on him, then you're, that, 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 that completeness never is taken away. In verse 15, wherefore the Holy Ghost also is a witness for us. For after that, he said before, now he's quoting in Jeremiah 31, and it says, the Lord said, so the Holy Spirit is God, the Lord in the Old Testament. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds where I write them. And their sins and iniquities are remembered no more. The Old Testament, again, I would just call it religion. What I mean by religion is you do good works. In this case, keeping the Ten Commandments. The problem is, how many of you guys recognize every sin you do, the problem starts in here, right? Anyone who commits adultery had lust here. Anyone who commits murder had hatred here. Anyone who steals had covetousness here. So as a religious person, I might not commit adultery, but I want to. I might not steal, but I want to. I might not murder someone. Anybody ever want to murder somebody? <laughs> you know, in your heart, but you don't do it. Okay, that's a religious person. But see, eventually those things come out. You're not going to win that battle. Anybody ever determine you're not going to lose your temper and then you lose your temper? You can't, you, you can't, can't control that. What's in, problems on the inside. What God is saying is, instead of having the commandments written in stone and you try to do it where there's something in you rebelling, he's going to reprogram you on the inside. He's going to change your heart to where instead of wanting to go against God, you start wanting to please God. Listen, I want to please the Lord, and I hate it when I don't. How many of you, when you fall or fail, you hate it? Yeah, because you, something in you has changed. I, and, and, I, and I tell people this, too, we're, we're not under the law. And so we're under grace and by the Spirit. And I tell people, I can do whatever I want as a Christian. And their reaction a lot of times is, what do you mean you can do drugs and party and sleep around. I don't want to do that stuff. Why would I want to do that? I want to please God. I literally can do what I want because 
God has put in me that I want to please him. How many of you want to please him? You want to honor him? See, that's because he's changed you on the inside. That's why it's not religion. And their sins and iniquities are remember no more. How many of you remember your sins? Remember your sins? Does the devil remember your sins? Does your spouse remember your sins? Listen, God does not remember them. So think about it. Can God do anything? Again, so can he make himself forget and not see your sin? Yep. And so imagine you've sinned and you're struggling and you confess it. And the Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive you. And a week later, you come back, God, I just, I just can't believe I said or did that. Lord, please forgive me. And he's looking at you like, what? What are you talking about? That's what, that's what he, he says. He remembers it no more. He's not, he's not, he doesn't see you in light of that. He sees what Jesus did. And now we're remission of these is there's no more offering for sin. And so again, see, in the Catholic Church, this idea of penance. See, they believe, they taught, and I'm not trying to slam Catholics, they, they taught faith and works. And so again, you sin, you got to do something to make up for it. You know, wasn't it saying like a certain number of Hail Marys? There's all these little things you got to do. They give you, confess to, it's like somehow you're, you're trying to pay for it a little bit yourself. But it says here, through Jesus, there's no more offering for sin. I don't have to do anything to pay for my sins. Why? Because it's already paid for. Remember the balance in the credit card? What's it say every time I look at it? Zero. The balance is the lead weight. It's gone. And so, you know what? I just confess it, Lord, and he's faithful just to forgive me and cleanse me. Verse 19. So having therefore, the word therefore is tied to what he just said. He's telling us there's this wonderful new way you can go to God through what Jesus did. The way is made, the door's open. So having this, because you have this, brethren, boldness to enter in. Interesting. You have boldness to enter in to the Lord's presence. You have a right to be there, okay? And, and by the, and by, into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. The holiest is, you know, we, we'd seen a couple weeks ago how the tabernacle is about maybe from that wall to that pole, from that wall almost to that pole. When you walked in, there was the table of showbread, had 12 loaves of bread, picture of the body of Jesus, but also the word of God. You had the menorah, the lampstand, the oil, the Holy Spirit, the light. You had the altar of incense and a curtain, the holiest of holies, and inside there was the ark. And I think this this is a picture of our bodies. We're, this is called, this Bible is called a tabernacle. And in the in the the ark had the the law, which is how many of you are convicted by the law and you, you know you're guilty, right? But above that was the mercy seat where God met them, where they sprinkled the blood. And so just picture this intimate place, this connection that you can have at any time with God. If you're basing it on your works, there's going to be times that you're going to feel cut off from God. But if you're going based on what Jesus did, this is saying. You can connect with God at any time, anywhere, okay? And this boldness, think about it this way. Imagine, let's say, say we, it was a summer day and you walked out, walked down the street, just pick any random house, walk up to the door, open it, and just walk right into their living room. How would you feel doing that? Would you feel out of place? Would you feel uncomfortable? They'd either beat you up or shoot you, right? Okay? You wouldn't, you wouldn't be welcome there. That's what it's like approaching God through the law, you are not good enough. You are not welcome there. You do not belong there, okay? But picture how your kids come into your house. They own the place, right? How many of you have, have, have adult children? Don't they just come into your house like they own the place? My, my adult kids, I've got some adult ones that have moved out. They're married. When they come over, they'll, they'll get into the bags of chips and food, look in the refrigerator like it's their house. And you know who's even more bold is the grandkids, Anything that's grandma and grandpa's, they know they can have. They walk in like they own the place. That's how we can go into God's presence. That's what it means here. I can go right into, I, I belong there because of Jesus. It's a wonderful thing because of his blood. By a new, it's not the Old Testament, it's a new way. The gospel, it's good news. Living, he's a living savior way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one goes to the Father but by me. And that's what the world hates, by the way. You're too narrow-minded. You say Jesus is the only way. Well, first of all, I've heard this said. I'm not surprised Jesus is the only way. I'm surprised that there is a way. How many of you are glad there is a way? And you know what? It isn't that I say it. He says it. I just believe it. And he gives evidence. 
a new and living way which he's consecrated for us, meaning he's set apart, he's made a way through the veil that is his flesh. The flesh veils us from the spirit. There is a spirit realm that exists in this room that you cannot see. Angels can be there, demons can be there, God's presence can be there. Just like there's radio waves and our frequencies going through here, and if you have a device that taps in, you can watch movies and there's voices. There's all kinds of things going on in this room that, that you can't see, okay? Well, there's a spirit realm. The flesh veils it. Um, we were all, when God made Adam and Eve, they were spirit, soul, body. The body was the lowest. Your soul is you, your, your will. You interact with the world to the body, but the spirit is where you interact with God. They were spirit conscious. God told them, the day you've eaten this tree, the fruit, you'll die. They didn't physically die on that day. They spiritually died. When they ate that fruit, the spirit part died. And just picture this flipping where the body became what they were conscious of. What's the first thing they noticed when they ate the fruit? Where's our clothes? They didn't even realize it at first. And the thing is, and until the spirit part is made alive, you will not have any connection with God. Well, what's interesting is Jesus' body, his flesh was ripped, broken, but it's a picture, this veil that God's presence on the other side, when, when, when Jesus died on the cross, it says it was ripped from top to bottom. It's like God's saying in the spirit now, I can connect with him. This body's not going to limit that. And um, sin's not going to limit that. And I'm telling you guys, at any time, I can get alone. And it isn't about feelings. It's about faith. But there's a, a very real sense of God's presence that I have. And I can tap into that at any time. We all can. And, and the way you do that, by the way, the spirit part gets strengthened by spending time with him in his word. But he says, that is, in having a high priest over, so high priest represents God to us and us to God. So he goes to God on our behalf, you know, telling the father the debt's paid and to accept us. And then he represents God to us. High priest over means in position. So it, he's, he's called the door. We walk through him. It's like he's standing there at the door of God's presence over the house of God. And so because of this, he says, let us draw near. How many of you want to be close to God? Anyone? How many of you have ever seen somebody where you're like, wow, that guy, man, he's connected with God. I want what he has. Have you ever seen someone like that? Chuck Smith was like that to me. He came here and spoke in 2011. I, I met him in 1988. I've on and off connection with him. But that guy just exuded God. And you can see that God was all over him and God was in his life and God was real to him. And I'm like, I want what he, want, what he has. Again, how many of you want something like that? You want that? Well, draw near to God, and it says he'll draw near to you. If somebody says to me, well, God's not close to me. I don't feel God's presence. Who's the problem? Is it God or is it them? If you don't feel God in your life, you're the problem, okay? Because it says here, there's a way made you can draw near. And again, you guys have heard me share this analogy over and over. Uh, Imagine a couple riding down the road in a pickup truck with a big bench seat and the wife sitting over by the door and she goes, honey, I remember when we were first married. I used to sit next to you and your arm was on my shoulder. You know, we're real close. I miss those days. And he looks over and says, I haven't moved. He's still in the driver's seat. He hasn't moved. He's in the same spot. Who's over by the door? Her. If, you're, if you can think of a time you were closer to God than you are now, who moved? You moved. Draw near. He says, let us draw near. You can right now, even this moment, when you leave today, Lord, I want to be close to you. I want to walk with you. I want to hear your voice. Draw near. He'll draw near to you with a true heart. True heart means honest on the inside. What keeps us from God is sin. So if, if you've lied, stolen, lust, pride, gossip, fill in the blank. If something comes to mind, just say, Lord, I confess this as sin. I'm guilty. Anything that comes to mind that might be a barrier between you and God, confess it. It says he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you. So a true heart means be honest on the inside. The danger is when he convicts you of something and you're not honest. You blame someone else, you make excuses, everyone does it, it's not that big a sin. Look, if you're convicted, Lord, I give this to you. He'll take it away, he'll wash it away. With a true heart and full assurance. Full assurance means a most certain confidence. When I go through Jesus, I can be certain that God's going to get closer to me as I get closer to him. I can be sure about that. Do you guys realize that? If you take time to get closer to him, he will get closer to you. And he said, having our hearts sprinkled, that's the blood of Jesus washing away my sins from an evil conscience. Like 
we won't be sinless, but we can always have a clean conscience. We can always have the sense that the bill is paid. Every time you open the credit card bill, what's it going to say? Bill says zero, even though I put some charges on there. And he says, and our bodies washed with pure water. That's baptism. Outward, outward sign. We have the inward. Our hearts are changed. Outwardly, the testimony. And he says, let us hold fast. So the, the purpose of this book is don't turn away. Don't walk away. And I'm telling you guys, there's a spiritual war to turn you away from Jesus, from the gospel to compromise. You need to hold on to. That means make secure um, or keep secure the profession of our faith. The fact that you say Jesus is the Christ, that he's the only way, that he died for your sins on the cross, hold on to that without wavering. And why? For he is faithful that promise, meaning God is going to keep his word. Hey, God says Jesus paid for your sins on the cross. If you come to him, your sins will be washed away. He'll present you faultless before his presence with singing. Is God faithful? Is God okay? He's going to keep his word? So you hold on to that. You're literally holding on to the fact that God is faithful. And then he says, let us consider one another to provoke and to love and a good work. So as you have this access, you go to God, you don't walk away from him. But now there's more. Consider each other to provoke, to love and a good works. Provoke means stir up to anger. It's kind of like this. Imagine you're on a football team and everybody is just working their rear end off in this battle and one guy's slacking and he's not doing his part. What does the rest of the team say to that guy? Hey, dude, what are you doing? Get up, do your job. Wouldn't that be the, wouldn't that be the attitude? Okay, you would be on him like, come on, man, you're part of the team, you got a responsibility. That's the idea. We're to do this with each other. Okay, look, do we need to read our Bibles? Hey, there's nothing wrong going up to another Christian and saying, hey, when's the last time you read your Bible? Well, I don't know, about a week. Well, you know what? You need to read it every day. We need to say that to each other. Hey, when's the last time you prayed or prayed with your spouse or came to prayer? Well, I don't know. I'm always so tired. Look, dude, buddy, you need to pray. It's important. We're all called to pray individually, our families, and as a church. How about sharing your faith? Should we all share our faith? I've had people leave this church because they said I made them feel guilty because they wouldn't share their faith. Look, if you're not sharing your faith, you're guilty. That's why you feel guilty. Are you supposed to share your faith? Are we all supposed to? We are. Okay, giving. As much as there's a black eye that the church has given when it comes to giving, we're called to give to God. How many recognize everything you have is from him? Are you thankful for that? Giving to the Lord financially is how you tell him thank you. We're all called to do this. And here's the thing. You know, if I came to you and said, look, you know, if you're not doing these things, something's wrong in you. Now, does that kind of irritate you a little bit? Would that irritate you if somebody got in your face and said that? See, that's what the word provoke means. See, we're supposed to irritate. And you know what? I irritate people. And I do. I do. Because you know what? We're in this battle together, and it's time to get off. Listen, guys, we're at the end. We need to wake up, okay? I had somebody that I, you know, the YouTube message that I was sending out, this person to listen to one of my messages, and they're like, hey, do you listen to it yet? You know, and I, about three or four days, do you listen to it yet? And they're like, you're like a fly. And so then I, the next time I just put B, 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 Z, 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 and it's funny, and, they, and they, they have been listening, and they're glad. Here's the thing, whether it's a lost person, whether it's a Christian, you know, provoke, that means Come on, it's time to be serious. You need, listen, you need to serve the Lord in some way. What are you doing? It's not works, it's not for our salvation. We're saved by grace, right? But because you're saved by grace, you have a responsibility. You need to read your Bible, you need to pray, you need to give, you need to serve, you need to share your faith. And um, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. A while back, there was this kind of a no church movement. I'm going to stay home and just have church with my family. Look, you should do that. That's good. But you still need to be interacting with the body of Christ. It's a place of blessing. There's three ways that your spirit is fed. Food for your spirit is God's word. Read the Bible every day. Prayer is like breathing. Okay, you can breathe all the time. You pray all the time. But fellowship, this here is like water. It's refreshing. If you read your Bible and pray, but you're not in fellowship with Christians, you will dry up. You need, we need each other, okay? And God's designed it that way. And, um, and I think social media is causing some of this. To know anything about anybody, you had to go to the mall, the diner, the bar, 
um, where else? Or church. Those are the places you'd meet people. Well, now people are, well, I'm going to stay home. I'm never going to put our messages live streaming here. It'll be on YouTube. You can watch it a few days later. I do not want someone staying home. Oh, I watched you on YouTube this morning. I'm not doing that. Because this is not about just me talking here. Afterwards, we're supposed to talk to each other. We have food upstairs, fellowship, or to pray together. And, um, and notice, too, it says, exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching, meaning the closer we get to Jesus' return, the darker it's going to get. We're going to need each other more and more because more and more from the world is going to be attacking us. And listen, you will not make it alone. God called us sheep. Sheep need to be together. The wolves eat the ones that are alone. Verse 26, he says, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Jesus came. He made the way. If you sin, you can go to him, okay? But if you know about Jesus, you continue in sin, you walk away from him, what's left? If, if you don't have Jesus in the cross, is there anything left? In the context of this, when you think of Hebrews, it was them going back to the Old Testament sacrifices. The sin in this case was basically turning away from the cross. They heard about the cross, they saw it, and they're like, you know what? We don't need that. If you, if you leave Jesus in the cross, is there any other place you can go for your sins? There is no other place. That's the idea. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Meaning, if I abandon the cross, then I'm going to pay for my own sins. And I, you know, Jesus, when he was in the garden, he said, Father, if it's possible, this cup pass from me. There's a cup with all of our name on it. It's the wrath of God. You're either going to drink it or you're going to accept that he drank it for you. Did Jesus drink all of it? He drank all of it, right? So if I go through him, there's no wrath left in me. But if I reject him, then I am facing, listen, all of a sudden I'm facing the credit card bill that's going to say, due date, pay up, buddy. And that's eternity away from him. And he says, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So here's the standard Moses. We have a better, more powerful message. So if he held him accountable for the lesser, he's going to hold us accountable if we re reject this. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant worthy as sanctified and an holy thing and done despite the spirit of grace. It's somebody who comes to the place where they say, Jesus, what you did on the cross doesn't mean anything, it wasn't worth anything. And the idea of grace, this opportunity that you can have the bill clean, the balances, the sin removed, you say, I don't want that. You know what? Nobody, God doesn't send anyone to hell. You go there by choice. You have to climb over Jesus on the cross. Who deserves hell? I think it's the person that looks at Jesus dying for them and walks away. And um, But if you believe and trust in him, you know, guys, then he's taken away the sin. You don't have to be afraid. In verse 30, for we know him that says, vengeance belongs to me. I will recompense, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. So, God's going to settle the score. Either you pay, accept Jesus paid the debt, or you're going to pay it yourself. And he said, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Who wants to be in God's hand as his anybody, as his enemy? Anybody want to be in that place? That's what he's saying. He's saying that if you reject Jesus, you're going to be in God's hand, and all that's left is him judging you. The Bible says there's two ways to come to him. One is the love of God. How many of you are thankful Jesus paid for your sins, your sins are washed away? That's his love. That's awesome. But then there's another valid motive for becoming a Christian, and it's fear. In Jude, it says, some say with fear, others um, with compassion. Listen, I was saved out of fear. I heard about the judgment coming on the earth, and I heard the gospel, and Jesus was the only way out, and I'm like, I don't want that. And so I came to the Lord. Again, how many of you don't want to be in God's hand as his enemy? Then make sure you know him. And he says, but called to remembrance. So as much as he's warning them about falling away and he's giving them a warning, now he's going to, you know, he's, he's going to give them a motive, which is, hey, remember what the Lord did for you, which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of affliction and partly why you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and actions, afflictions. Well, I'm getting to where I can barely read these words. I'm going to have to give me a bigger Bible. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, by reproaches and afflictions, and partly why you became companions of them that were so used. What he's saying is, when you were first saved, you were so thankful 
that you would do anything for Jesus. You know, if you're the group of people and they started making fun of you, you didn't care. And I remember this. And he's saying, remember, the Bible talks about remembering. Jesus said, the church of Ephesus, you left your first love. Remember, and think of first love for a second. When you, when you first know the Lord, there is this first. It's kind of like in marriages, by the way. You know, when you see a new couple, they're all, aren't they excited about each other? Everything's new. There's a joy. You guys, how many of you remember that when you were married, okay? The problem is we lose that first love. Why is that? And I actually, I remember when Matthew was sitting right back there when he was winning over his wife and then my son-in-law to my daughter and then Caleb is his wife. And I watched them and they were, they were so excited to be with each other. And I remembered how me and Sheila were that way and it wasn't there. I'm like, what is it about the first love? You're always trying to win the person over and you're always trying to please them and you won't do anything to offend them. But when you get married, you, you stop doing that. And so I remember consciously making a choice. I'm going to start winning Sheila over. Because, you know, she was raising 14 kids. I was doing the church. And um, we didn't have any problems, but I just we didn't have that first love. And so I started doing little things. You know, making my favorite thing is making her coffee before she has a chance to go in there and bringing it to her, whether it's turning the bed back at night or making it in the morning. When she gets up, I make the bed, okay? I remember making a bubble bath and putting candles in there. She thought I was doing it for me, okay? I was, and I said, that's for you, honey. And for a couple years, I did this, and I didn't see, I didn't see a whole lot of response. And, and I'm like, do you, like, notice anything here? <laughs> Different, and she goes, I'm trying to get used to the new mic. But it's working. It's been about 10 years, and I, but the point is, and it wasn't, the idea is you're trying to win them over. Now think back to Jesus. When you when you're saved, you're in the word, you're in fellowship, you're wanting to serve him, live for him. You're doing all this stuff and there's an excitement there. But it's easy to lose that edge to where you're not seeking him, you're not wanting to serve him and it can go cold. So he's saying, remember what that was like. You know, you, you want to be closer to the Lord now than any other time in your life. And he said, for you have compassion on me and my bonds and took the joyfully, the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and more enduring substance. He's saying, even when it came to giving, Paul was in need, and you were joyful about giving. You know, I remember once I asked, or I heard someone, I was standing next to Chuck Smith, and someone said, hey, Chuck, do you tithe? And he kind of chuckled, and he had a genuine joy, and he said, that's nowhere near enough anymore. And I realized, how many of you realize everything you have is from God? Are you thankful about that? Giving to God is you saying, Lord, thank you. I'm thanking you. And he says, we're to honor him on the first fruits of our increase. And he's saying when they were first saved, man, they love doing that. What happens is we get to where all of a sudden it becomes a burden. Oh, I don't know if I, you know, well, I have to do this. You don't have to do anything. It's a joy. And you got to remember what he did for you. But um, verse 35, cast not away your confidence, which, you know, your profession of faith, the fact that you said you're a Christian, that you knew him, don't let go of that. And he says, which has a great recumbence of reward. There is a battle we're in now. The, the reward's coming, and it's by faith. For you have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Listen, so many people come to the Lord with their lives a wreck, and I've met people who will do that, and then they'll turn away. And I'm like, what are you doing? Well, I came to the Lord, and you know, I still have all these problems, and I just didn't see any benefit. They didn't wait long enough. You know, when you plant a seed... If you go back the next day, say plant corn, you go back the next day, is there going to be a full corn stock? No. In the Bible, it talks about like, like if you sow to the flesh, like you could sow evil things and that produces a crop, right? Maybe, you know, 30 years, you sow bad stuff. You got all these problems in your life. Well, when you start serving the Lord, you're, you're planting new things. Is it going to take time to see the blessings? Yes. And that's what people don't realize. You walk with the Lord because he's true. I mean, I've had, I've asked people this, well, how long have we been walking with the Lord? About three months. I'm like, man, it's got to be your whole life. You've got to be convinced he's the Christ. You live for him, and he will be faithful. You have need of patience. There are battles. There are trials. Paul talks about the, the power of the resurrection, but he said the fellowship of his sufferings. There, every person God used had to go through preparation, hard things, and then God used them and blessed them. You've got to be willing to go through the hard things. And he says, so we all need patience. Anybody here need patience? For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Do you realize right now we're, the, we're closer to Jesus' return than any time in human history? Think about that one. 
here's the thing. There are signs all around us, guys. We're at the end. Look at what's happening with Russia linking with Iran and how brazen they're getting. Okay, Russia is rising, and they're going to they're going to go after Israel. The Bible predicts that with um, Iran, um, with Libya, China, a world power, they're flexing their muscles. The Bible predicts them. Israel is surrounded by na- the whole world. Chaos with society, guys. The chip is here. It says you want me to buy or sell without a mark in your right hand or in your forehead. And if you take that mark, you can't be saved. Okay, if you take that. Anyone following this? These are all over. Arkansas just passed a law forbidding companies to force an employee to take it. That was just passed this November. Okay, it's here. The technology's here. And if you take that mark, it can't be saved. Listen, here's another one that's troubling to me. You know, America is the most influential nation in the world. And it's like, where are we at? Where are we at? Go read Revelation 18. Revelation 17 says, Mystery Babylon, it's a religious entity. Sits on seven hills. I'm certain that it's Rome. I have no doubt in my mind. False religion. It's destroyed in chapter 17. Chapter 18 doesn't say Mystery Babylon. It says Babylon the Great. It's an economic Babylon that the whole world is connected through trading. Okay, they're weeping because there's no one to buy their stuff. And they're afar off in the sea watching it burn. What nation could you nuke and the rest of the world watch it burn? There's only one. And what nation buys all the world's goods? Do you guys realize our, we're printing money out of nothing? We're buying the rest of the world's goods? Go read Revelation 18. And in the attitude, I sit a queen, I'm no widow, I'll never see sorrow. Does America have an arrogance? We've had, a, we've had prosperity more than any nation in the history of the world. It says by whose sorceries, which is drugs, pharmacia, and the nation are deceived. We're, paying, we're, we're putting money out for abortion around the world. And, and, then, and this thing with New York, up to birth abortion, do you guys realize God is going to destroy our nation? He's only waiting to give people a chance to be saved. The point is, we are on the doorstep of Jesus coming back. It cannot go much longer. And I do believe... The church here, we're a preserving influence. I think he's going to take us. And then things are going to collapse. The only thing keeping the Antichrist and the one world government from happening is this nation. When the dollar collapses, you will go to a cashless society and there's going to be a one world government. That could happen tomorrow. Do you guys realize that could happen tomorrow? We're right there. So he that shall come will come. Now the just shall live by faith. Your life is by trusting the gospel what Jesus said on the cross. You have a choice. Lord, you're the Christ. I believe I trust you. Hold on to that. That's where your life comes from. If any man draw back, and, and, and draw back means to shrink from declaring or conceal. So you're to be out there as a light. If you're afraid and you draw back from that profession, hey, he says, my soul will have no pleasure in him. But we're not of them that draw back to perdition, meaning and that's literally damnation. You don't want to go backwards. And he's saying we're not of them. If you're saved, then that's not you. But we're of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Believing is an active thing. It's not passive. How many of you believed in the past that Jesus is the Christ and you're saved? But you know what? You're to keep believing today. And you know what? And you're to believe to the saving of the soul. And I've heard this, this question of, you know, is, you know, internal security, is it once saved, always saved? Well, Chuck Smith had a neat phrase. He said, I'm eternally secure as long as I believe in Jesus. How many believe in Jesus? Keep believing him. That's what it's saying. Um, we're to believe the saving of the soul. Everything, every battle is going to be the devil trying to turn you from that simple thing that Jesus is the Christ. He paid for my sins. He's the only way to God. That's where the battle is going to be. You need to hold on to that. We're going to end with um, 1 Peter 1. So turn there. And um, because, listen, guys, the he- people in Hebrews, the Jews that the Hebrews are running to, they were under pressure. There were battles. Guys, there's battles all around us to try to get us to turn away from what we know. And so 1 Peter 1, verse 3. First, he shows all that God has done for us, which we saw in Hebrews. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. This is all that he's done for us, who are kept. He's holding on to you by the power of God. What's your part? Through faith. You need to keep trusting him. Unto salvation, which will already be revealed in the last day, wherein you greatly rejoice. How many of you rejoice? 
that the, the balance says zero and that you're forgiven. Okay, we rejoice in that. Though if need be for a season, you're in heaviness through manifold temptation. So as a Christian, I can be saved and still be kind of struggling because I'm in a spiritual battle. And he says, why? That the trial of your faith, literally, you're going to be tested whether you believe Jesus is the Christ, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though be tried in the fire, might be found in the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. If you get through this world and say, you know what? Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he's my hope. You made it. And that's, what's the, and that's what you're going to, he wants to bring you through that faith. Whom having not seen you love. How many of you love Jesus though you haven't seen him? And whom though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable, full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Look, guys, a way has been made. We need to hold on to that. And in the end, guys, eternity is going to be here in a blink. And so if you're sitting here and you're not saved or you're trusting your works, you can, listen, you can go through the door through Jesus. He's made a way. If you are saved, listen, draw near to him. Are you as close to him as you can be? Listen, he hasn't moved. You can get closer. Remember when you were first saved. Lord, I thank you for your word. And I do pray if there's anyone here that's not sure, they die tonight or they go to heaven, help them to call on your name to be saved. If there's someone here who's thought of it like the balance, is like they're trying to do good works to earn, help them to see they can't. Help them to see it's a gift that you paid for their sins on the cross and that if they open their heart to you, you'll come in. And Lord, for all of us, who are saved. You've made a way we can draw near. Help us to draw near. Lord, help us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Help us to provoke each other to love and good works. Lord, help us to realize that you're coming back soon. And Lord, that, that even though there's pressure to conceal and the, in the, in the compromise and to hide our faith, help us, Lord, to believe and open our mouth and appoint people to you. Help us to realize time is short and you've made a way. Thank you, Lord, that we're forgiven. Our sins are washed away. The, 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 the bell says zero. And we can approach you. Lord, I pray that we'd all approach you and that we yield to you. And just as you yield to the Father, Jesus, that we'd yield to you. Use us, Lord, to be a light, to bring your hope. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. May this be a week that your number one goal is to draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. And as you connect, as you listen, may Jesus live through you just like the Father lived through Jesus. So God bless you guys.